Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the Cryptoverse. Today, we're gonna to talk about Bitcoin, and we're gonna be putting back on our on-chain analysis hat. And we are going to be talking about HODL waves, or HODL waves, if you prefer. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and also check out the Telegram channel, which you can find a link to in the description below. Now, I should say, a lot of people think that HODL has always meant hold on for dear life. And certainly when Bitcoin drops 40%, that really does feel like what we are doing. But I will take this, this uh, moment to remind people or to inform you that HODL originated not from an acronym of hold on for dear life, but just someone simply misspelling the word hold when they say what they were holding after there was a pretty significant drop in prices many years ago, okay? So let's go ahead and jump in. And, and I, I would like to say with a typical disclaimer, when we talk about on-chain data, it is, you know, it, it can be manipulated by, by people if they want to just send a lot of different transactions or send a lot of Bitcoin over, you know, tons of different transactions to a lot of different wallets. It is possible to, to have an effect on what we see. With that disclaimer, though, let's go ahead and jump in. So one of the things we, we've talked about before is wallet sizes. And I thought it would be interesting to visualize the percentage of all of all of the, the current Bitcoin in wallets of various or uh, in wallets for various time frames. OK, and to break it down by percentage as to what percentage of wallets that have been holding their Bitcoin for, say, one month to three months make up the entire supply. And perhaps we can use these trends to better understand when when the market is getting really overheated and a lot of new players are coming in, or when it's a fairly decent time to accumulate with a macroscopic mindset, all right? Now, with that said, let's go ahead and dive into this chart. So the first thing we should look at is perhaps the, the shortest time frame. And, and just for your reference, we have many different times frame here, many different time frames here. We have less than a day, one day to one week, one week to one month, one month to three months, three to six months, six to 12 months, one year to two years, two to three years, three to four years, four to five, five to 10, and then greater than 10 years. And so one of the things with this chart is it really does take a while, I think, to digest it, okay? You might look at this chart and say, well, two to three years, does that mean it's 70% of the supply? And you know, the answer is no, right? It's not 70% of the supply that's been held in two years or that's been, been held for two to three years. It's just, it's a stacked chart. And so if you hover over, you know, say the two to three year mark, like if you look at where this is and, and just look for the two year to three year mark, you can see it's at 7.77%. 7 7 so the distance on this chart, on this y-axis would be 7.77. So you can get an idea of how these things work. So let's isolate each one and see if it tells us anything interesting about investor behavior for Bitcoin. So... This is what less than one day looks like. And I actually am hard pressed to imagine that there would be many people that watch this channel that are very, uh, you know, that are, that are trading their Bitcoin every single day or moving it, moving it back and forth on, on a daily basis. But maybe they just like to check in to see how, how us, um, you know, people who don't like taking on as much risk, how, how they live. And, and so congratulations if you are moving your Bitcoin, you know, um, and you've only had it in your wallet for, for, say, a day, you are actually part of this chart right here. And so you've been holding that Bitcoin for, for less than one day, and you are accounting for this. Now, you might notice that early on, the one-day percentage actually accounted for a lot more. But you also have to consider back then, when it was first launched, I mean, you know, on the very first day, that was the only option, right? You, you only had held your Bitcoin for less than one day. And so it, it comes down relatively quickly. And then during this run, you know, not a lot of people knew what even Bitcoin was, or if they bought it, they were just selling it because it just went up like crazy. And so you can't really fault them necessarily for, for just wanting to take profits. And, and, and for also for people that are, you know, constantly uh, buying and selling back then, I mean, it, it wasn't this thing that we thought necessarily was going to one day go to $69,000. You know, I mean, it was just trading for pennies or a few dollars. Um, but what I, what I would say is you sort of notice that over time, it does become a smaller and smaller percentage, okay? And I, I think this is because, you know, just a lot of people are, are, are feel that conviction to, to continue holding Bitcoin for longer periods of time. One day to one week, not really a whole lot that you can see. I mean, there are 
there are definitely some some brief spikes and you'll actually notice those spikes um you know, uh, leading into to major major tops. But if you actually hover over to see the percentage of the one day to one week, for instance, if we go to say the the market cycle bottom back in 2015, the one day to one week crowd was made, made up five percent. By the peak of the cycle, the one day to one week crowd made up about almost eight percent. So a slight difference. If we go to the bottom of this cycle, the one day to one week crowd made up seven percent. And then if we go to say at least the 64K region, it made up only 3%, which I, I actually think is, is somewhat interesting there. But again, on the long on the lower time frames, it, it can be hard to, to to really understand what's going on, especially because you're fighting the narrative of, of holders who some of them never sell their Bitcoin. And so they're always going to be contributing to the larger percentages. As we go into longer time frames, you can you can start to understand a little bit more about, about what's going on. And then furthermore, stacking and grouping them. I think also paints a, a nice picture. And we'll look at that after we go through each individual one. So looking at say the one week to one month, you'll notice that there does, a, you know, there, there certainly are expansion and contraction phases in it. Uh, for instance, here at this local top back in 2017, the one week to one month was about 19%. It then fell all the way down to 11%, probably because some people thought that that was it and that we weren't gonna have this final leg. Um, and so you see this sort of this sort of this behavior over and over again, and then it, it then it then goes back up into the market cycle peak, and then it comes significantly down because in in a bear market, you know these people aren't aren't going to necessarily be trading it. It's constantly because they they bought potentially they're underwater in their investment, and they're just going to hold on for better or for worse. If we go to the one month to three months, this is what you get. All right. And, and interestingly, you, you see some similar patterns again that play out, right? Going into, going into market cycle peaks, you can see some, you know, some level of, of uh, contraction, or sorry, expansion here going into a market cycle peak, and then it, and then it contracts significantly just after it, right? And this, and this is the, the, the one month to three months. And then, and then most recently, we saw, it, we saw it start from all the way at around 9%, and then it dropped down a little bit early on, and then by by the by the distribution phase, it was all the way up at, at 15 to 16 percent. So there were a lot of new retail investors coming in and getting Bitcoin for the first time, or maybe maybe seasoned investors were, were just getting more more Bitcoin. But the, they they do tend to go up during those mania phases, and then following it, you can see that it, it actually drops off significantly in terms of the percentage. All right. Now going to three to six months, this is what three to six months looks like. Here is six to 12 months. This is probably where it actually starts to get somewhat interesting because with, with the six to 12 months, you'll really notice a contraction going into a, a, a final mania phase, okay? And you notice that in 2017, uh, how it contracts significantly, like from, from just before, let's say the beginning of 2017, the six to 12 months was at about 14%, but by the market cycle peak, the six to 12 months was at about 8%. Okay, so it did reduce significantly. So basically, the idea is that it's going to become a smaller and smaller percentage. And it, it's hard sometimes understanding why. Is it because they're taking profits and, and it's no longer there? Or is it just because a lot of new people are coming in and then sort of diluting the percentage of, of, of Bitcoin and other because, you know, all these people that are buying Bitcoin for the first time? Obviously, it's probably a combination of both. But you sort of see that play out. Um, right there in 2017. And then you also see a similar thing over here in early 2021, as the percentage of the six to 12 months was about 11 or 12% at the end of 2020. And then as we got into early 2021, you can see that it dropped back down to about 8% or so again. And then right now, the, the percentage of six to 12 months is actually at around uh, 18 or 19%. So I, I think if you look at this chart, you know, the moral of the story is that buying it, buying Bitcoin when these things are, when the six to 12 month anyways is peaking out, historically is not necessarily the, the best time to buy Bitcoin. But in fact, once it, you know, once it comes down significantly and starts to level off a bit, you could argue that it, it actually starts to become a much better buy, uh, just like it was over here where it started to really level off um, and, and then where it currently is uh, today. And basically what I mean by that is the, this, this thing is actually contracting significantly. Okay, so it, it, or expanding significantly. It contracts here and then it expands here to take up a larger and larger, larger percentage.
If we go to, to one year to two year, you see a very similar thing. You see contraction around the peaks and then expansion during the phase following, you know, following that phase. Okay. And in 2013, if we go to say the 2013, you'll see, you know, it, it expands and then contracts around the first peak. And then it also, you know, it continues contracting actually uh, by the second peak and then it starts expanding later on. And then, so if we highlight that, you can see that it, it did contract going into, into April uh, or sorry, earlier this year, like January, February, and March, but that really it didn't, it didn't do a whole lot um, during the, during that, say that, that period where we were between um, uh, the move from 29K to, to 69K, it didn't really do a whole lot. And only recently it started to expand again. And one of the reasons you could argue that it's expanding again is because people, you know, the people that bought before over the last six months, they're, they're just less likely to take profits at this point, or they probably don't have profits to take because they're underwater on their investment. So they're more likely to just hold it for a longer period of time and then wait for better times, which I do think is, is not a bad strategy. Uh, here's two to three years, definitely periods of contraction um, and expansion as, as we go through it. Here's three to four years, four to five years, five to 10, and then greater than 10 years. But I, I think one of the things that, that, that's worth noting and we, we put this on here, is that during the 2013 and 2017 bull runs, the percentage of short-term supply held for 180 days or less reached about 50%, which corresponded with, with market cycle tops. And so what if we isolate just 100, you know, 180 days or so? Um, so this, is, this would be all of these wallets that you can see, uh, or sorry, this is showing wallets that held for at least 180 days, okay? And the argument is that if it's held for 180 days or less, let's go look at the reverse of that. So here's, here's all the wallets stacked holding it for less than 180 days. What you'll notice is that we tend to see major peaks in, in this, like the percentage is, uh, reaches a fairly high point up near local tops or market cycle tops. So you see one here, you see it again here, and then right after this one, right after this one, and again, right after this one. And so right now, when we look at this, we say, well, where are we today? Are we at a peak? No, I mean, it doesn't certainly look like we're at a peak in, in terms of the, um, you know, the, num the percentage of Bitcoin being held in wallets for, for less than 180 days. It looks like we are, in my opinion, we're just in a long reaccumulation phase. And in that, in that sense, again, we've been in it between 30 and 60K ever since that phase. Um, you just have to be okay with the volatility here in the short term. You know, whether it means 40K holds and we go up, whether it means we dip down to 35K or something and then go up, it just doesn't really matter in the long term, okay? Now, if you think Bitcoin's gonna go back to $5,000, then okay, maybe it matters to you. I don't think it's gonna go back down to those values. Um, I don't think it's gonna go to 10K either. And so with that in mind, I, I, more low look, I more so look at the long-term picture and say, you know what? There's gonna be short-term volatility to the upside and the downside. We don't really care about that. It's just a matter of, of basically stacking sats, in my opinion, not that it's financial advice, until we get another mania phase and it's just another it, it's just a matter of time and uh, until we get another in, another surge in the market and it you know it could be it could be three months away it could be eight months away it could be 15 months away we simply do not know i i my argument though is that i don't think we're going to have to wait until 2025 or something to see a new all-time or 2024 i don't think we're gonna have to wait until 2024 or 2025 to see a new all-time high I do think it will come before then. So I look at this chart and say, well, the short-term supply uh, has, has gone down significantly back down to about 30%. We can see that this was, you know, this was the level that it was bad back in uh, the end of 2018, 2019 and 2020, before we saw another surge, we saw the same thing over here. So I say, you know, is it possible we have many more months of, of playing in the sandbox before we do anything exciting? It is. But real, you know, realistically, this is probably my favorite time in the cryptoverse is, is when, when the, the people that are um, only in it for a few weeks, once they, they kind of leave because they're not really that interested in it, and then you just sort of, you, you flush out all of that. You also flush out all the garbage projects in the space, or at least some of them, and, and you, you, you get stronger, right? Bitcoin gets stronger. So this is what it looks like. You can see these peaks that form relatively well on the uh, short-term holders. If you want to go look at, at say, long-term holders, this is people that are holding it for, say, at least six months or more, what you'll see is that you get, you get peaks, but the peaks on this tend to occur to the best time to buy, 
right? So a peak here, best time to buy, right? Came up again over here in December 2018. Such a great time to buy. Again, you, you see, and actually this entire phase was a great time to buy, right? This was an entire great time to buy leading into the parabolic rally. This was a great time to buy leading into this parabolic rally. And look where we are. I mean, we're not we're not at a at a bottom here where it's at a market cycle top, right? So it's not like it, it's not like we're looking at this chart and saying, oh, it's it's coming down significantly as if we're at a major market cycle top. No, it doesn't look like that at all. In fact, it's just been going up. I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this move to 69K that we saw, while it was technically a new all-time high, I still would argue we're just in long reaccumulation between mostly 30 and 60K with some deviation to the to the to to below it and above it. So we went to 29K, we went to 64K and 69K. I think that this is just a long reaccumulation phase. And I think that long-term holders support this claim, in fact. I mean, look where we are today. It did come down here during the during this distribution phase earlier in 2021, but it didn't come it didn't really come down at all in this most recent one. So what this tells me, one of the things this tells me is that the people that sold over here um, there are a lot of people that probably sold back over there that have not returned. So we, you know, they they probably bought Bitcoin at 60k. They watched it go to 30k. They said, "All right, I'm just going to cut my losses and leave and not come back." And now they're gone. If you're still here watching this video in early 2022, then unfortunately for you, maybe I say that you know, fortunately, but you know, I sort of say it tongue in cheek, right? Unfortunately for you, for better or for worse, I do think you are stuck in the cryptoverse and you aren't going anywhere for a, you know, you're just here, right? This is where you are. This is where you reside now in the cryptoverse. So make sure you get comfortable. And I look at this and say, you know what? We had a period before where, where long-term percentage or, you know, percentage of, of supply in long-term holders hands was high. This was an accumulation phase. See it over here in 2019, 2020, early 2021. It was an accumulation phase leading into the blow off top or at least distribution phase. Again, where do we find ourselves? We find ourselves in a accumulation phase. Does it mean we can't go? I mean, does it mean we can't go to 50K, 30K, 45K, 60K, whatever? Who cares, right? It's just a long accumulation phase, in my opinion, before we ultimately break to six figures. Hopefully this video is useful. I think these, these you know, hodl waves or hodl waves, however you want to call them, I, I do think they are somewhat interesting. If you want access to, to the website, again, into the cryptoverse.com, you'll get access to a whole lot more than this. You get access to weekly reports three weekly premium videos on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays, uh, the Telegram Alerts channel, Telegram chat room, the Risk dashboard, all these, you know, these on-chain charts and, and more. A whole lot, so check it out. You can always cancel after one month if it's not your thing. But I do think that diving back into the on-chain analysis is useful and we will continue to do so on this channel. As we have said, it would be nice if we could step up our game as we continue on in 2022. Thank you guys for tuning in. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. Give the video a thumbs up. Click the bell icon to turn on notifications. And I will see you next time. Bye.